Perfect, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello everyone, um, my name is Winoka Yepa. I am the Senior Museum Education Manager at IAIA Museum Contemporary Native Arts. Um, we are located on the traditional homelands of the Tewa people, um, also known as Oyapoga Wingay, or White Shell Water Place. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to Mopna's panel discussion today, uh, which will be moderated by Mopna's curatorial assistant, Hank Cooper, and features um, student curator, Jamie Harrell, and BFA exhibition artist, Chelsea Bighorn, um, Suri Sonko, and Huku Ito. And so um, before we begin, um, I would like to inform everyone that this is a recorded session, uh, which will be available on our YouTube page. Um, after the discussion ends. Um, so, so if you don't follow our YouTube page, definitely go there and follow us and you'll see a lot of our public programs that we have done in the past. Um, so throughout this public program, um, if you have any questions for our panelists, um, please place them in the chat box and or in the QA, Q and A function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we will have a Q and A session later. So for now, um, I will hand it over to Hank Cooper. Um, my name is Hank Cooper. I am the curatorial assistant here at the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts as part of IAIA. Um, and I am actually sitting in the gallery space of the uh, BFA artists senior exhibition, We Went Wild, um, curated by student curator, Jamie Harrell. Um, we are going to have I imagine a very exciting conversation. Um, it's great to see everyone's faces. I am super honored to be a part of this and have felt such um, since day one. Uh, the work is incredible that you all have been working on um, throughout the last couple of years. And um, we just want to kind of learn more about your process and what it's been like for you um, in your journeys um, due to, you know, the pandemic restrictions on campus, um, you know, personal lives still going, um, all the stress of uh, schoolwork on top of your creative work and your hobbies. Um, I know that you all were all working on midterms when we were installing and uh, Friday, I believe marks the end of your semester. So you all have been incredibly busy. And I just want to reiterate, you know, what an honor it is to have your work here and um, just how awesome you guys are for um, showing up and, uh, and providing the work that you do and sharing it with us. Um, with that, I would like to pass it over to student curator, Jamie Harrell, and um, she's going to give us a little bit of context about uh, the thematics of the show and where inspiration came from when gathering this work. Thank you, and thank you, um, Suni and Fuku and Chelsea for taking time. It is finals. It is finals week for all of us, and these seniors are walking into the end of their BFA. So congratulations, and thanks for taking time this afternoon. Um, I did want to also thank um, all of the artists that are in this show, and thank you, Hank, um, uh, Flannery, Barney, Sally We Saw Sloan, um, Erica and Jasmine, <laughs> um, Winoka Yepa, Austin Big Crow, and um, Donna Walters as well, a little behind the scenes could not have done the curatorial side um, in this in this um, wild, busy existence for all of us. So um, so on to on to this this exhibition, I, I was asked to do this um, right at the beginning of October, I suppose. So we had about five, six weeks to work together and there's 10, 10 artists showing in this exhibition. Um, and so I was able to curate these pieces um, of these artists who have been working so, so diligently and so hard, all of you, and later you all will be able to speak on this, but in the existence that we've been presented, um, as we're having a panel over Zoom and not in person, right? Um, because of, of COVID, I think 
there is a powerful emotional you know existence whether we are aware of it or not um and this show speaks to these artists creating despite all of the their challenges emotionally physically i mean this has been a, a huge telling time you know for for our existence and um i wanted to truly truly i mean you see the dark colors in the back of this so even visually there there is really really deep emotion happening and interpreted in all of these artists pieces um and you each will be able to share with us today your direct interpretations and and what inspired you and during the really challenging time of the whole year prior to this working remotely and then finally we're in our spaces together um and so i'm was honored to to curate your works and i'm excited to hear what you all have to say today so we're going to open up with kind of a general question for for anyone that feels moved to uh to answer i know that it's um it's kind of nuanced as far as um i know all of you all come from different um, lengths of experience showing in different environments um and what i'm wondering um as a curator in the field um in what ways have museum or gallery environments supported and adequately represented you as an artist and uh, in what ways could you imagine a successful experience where your work is involved if um, you don't have any specific um, instances to speak on um, i'm curious as to what your experience is like or what an ideal experience would look like considering the majority of this work is you know culturally personal um or and even political So um, can anyone go? Okay. Urpiliai uh, Sonkoliai, Poyeko Panaikuna. Thank you again for having me. It is an honor to be here and share a bit about myself as an artist and my work. Um, so to answer the, the question, um, I feel like every show is different. I've had some of these pieces that have um, traveled to different places and been uh, in, in different spaces. And I feel like it, each place of those gives it like a home. So it depends to me like what pieces is my, my art is interacting with and it creates that specific uh, dialogue between the different art that is being being shown together. I, I feel like the show at Mokna is really special because it is my work being shown with a lot of my uh, good friends and people I've been um, going through this journey at IAIA with for several semesters. And it really represents that experience as an artist and indigenous person from the south being at a place like IAI where I had the opportunity to um, interact and learn and share with all different indigenous people from from the whole northern part of this continent so for me that has been a great way to also represent in a certain way my people that are um, many times like too often indigenous people from the south are not present in conversations you know like throughout the whole continent and there is a lot of live culture live indigenous culture 
down south. So we're often referred to as Latino or Hispanic. And that this experience is a great opportunity to weave back together our cultures uh, through art. And I'm very thankful for that. So this uh, specific show at Mokna really represents that. I, I love seeing all the art from different cultural backgrounds uh, woven together. So I feel that is very important as like in my work as an artist. And it is what I value so much about being at IAI. Thank you, Suni. Um, that absolutely, um, you know, segues into uh, a question that I had for for everyone, really. But um, just thinking about how uh, distance informs your work, how far away or close you are to home, um, and how that affects your creative process, how that um, you know, affects the modes of how you tell your story and, or how your, your story is received. Um, Huku, do you mind um, speaking a little bit about your work? Um, because I know home is Japan for you. Um, there is actually a, a, an artist um, whose indigenous community is in Japan as well, featured in the exposure, exposure exhibition. Um, and so it's pretty special to have uh, you and Kohi uh, represented here. Um, please tell us a little bit about your work. Sure. Um, before I get started, I would like to um, show gratitude. Um, thank you so much for having me for today's discussion. And I'm very much honored and excited to be here as one of the panels today. So thank you again. And also about my culture, um, the last time I was in Japan was two and a half years ago, so 2019, May, and I haven't been able to go home in Japan for a while. And that's part of the reason why I created um, this Vagina Chopstick Rest. Um, and so about my work, um, specifically this Chopstick Rest, um, I've noticed that a lot of students here at IAIA incorporate with their own cultural identity in their artworks and they capture their tribe history, trauma, culture, and so on in their artworks. So from seeing their cultural, culture-oriented works, I was inspired to create something that talks about my culture. So that's how I landed on the idea of making something that represents my country. And my dad back home in Japan, um, he's actually a sushi chef. And as I was growing up, I used to help him with dishes and setting up tables at the restaurant. And I was in charge of wishing, uh, washing chopsticks and chopstick rest. So um, that's another reason why I decided to make this chopstick rest. And um, with this chopstick rest, um, I wanted to address and acknowledge female identity, as well as their dignity in Japanese culture and traditions. Because in Japan, I we still have a very strong patriarchal society, and men are superior to women. And at home, at work, at anywhere, um, men, um, women are oppressed by them. And in Japanese household, women are required to be responsible for all the chores, housing, housekeeping tasks, and raising the kids. And men are only, only expected to work and feed the family. All the other tasks go to the mother and female, <clears throat> and female workers don't get promotions or equal pay and they cannot come back to work after leaving the position, especially when it was a maternity leave. And there are huge issues. This, these are huge issues in Japan, but the real problem is that people in Japan don't see them as an issue and they see them as just part of their culture. 
because the tradition of respecting men over women is so attached to our cultural identity. It's just a natural way of how we treat one another under this patriarchal society. And we are basically blinded by the cultural accepted norms and nobody questions that messed up system. So I felt the urge and passion to address this issue by making it visible to reveal who we really are to the world because this issue needs to be addressed and acknowledged by the wide public since this is not a small issue we can ignore, especially with the rest of the world thinks that Japanese culture is cool because we have anime, Godzilla, manga, and, and other stuff too. And everyone adore and admire our, our culture, which I really appreciate. However, unfortunately, that's not everything, what we are or who we really are. There's the side of us, which is the man dominant culture. So with that being said, this vagina chopstick rest is a confession of discrimination against a woman in Japan. And it is also helping Japanese people to unblind their eyes and what is really going on within our culture. Um, that's a story behind my work. And I noticed that my piece ended up being very loud. Um, it doesn't speak to you physically, but when you look at the piece, um, you see that it's pretty explicit and it will make you think why you're looking at this piece and where or how um, this artist decided to create this piece. So um, I'm glad that my work turned out to be a very thought provoking piece. Fuku, I was so excited to see and receive your work. Um, and for those of you that haven't visit, visited the gallery yet, um, the, we, we were able to display her work in a way that we built an actual, as soon as I saw these and the way that she had presented um, her, her work to us when she submitted her portfolio for this, um, I was like, there has to be a sushi bar. Right. So we, you know, at, at the at the museum, well, Austin, Big Crow and Flannery, thank you, built me a personal bar so I could display Fuku's work in a way that you have to stop. You have to look into it. I set stools out as if you were walking up to a sushi counter, you know, but truly, I mean, like what your what you um, have interpreted in your work is political, you know, and it's so right. And it's so it's such a global thing but also speaks so deeply to the personal identities you know and personal identity for women in Japan as well so we've got a wonderful there we go awesome thank you thank you Hank for sharing that um, so we have a wonderful um, display of of your of your work um, and I was so excited to have it and um, there's also a great um, you wrote up a great thing that we've got on the wall as well giving very thorough background so thank you so much for for sharing that with us of course thank you so much for having my work at the uh, gallery I actually haven't been able to go to the gallery yet so thank you for the picture <laughs> oh Fuku, you're gonna love it how exciting <laughs> well yep. all for you <laughs> Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of a newbie when it comes to syncing technologies and whatnot. Um, <laughs> so I hope that gave somebody, somebody out there a visual of um, the piece that we're talking about. Thank you, Fuku, for telling us all about it and um, just how incredible, um, incredibly brave you are to speak up for a lot of folks that don't feel comfortable, you know, talking about the, the realities of, um, you know, gender roles and um, patriarchy. And um, so let's see, we, we have a question from uh, a viewer that we can kind of segue into. Um, 
from Richard Neal. Um, he says, as a group of student artists from a great variety of both physical and cultural spaces, what, if anything, have you found that you have in common across these lines with other students? So that is uh, kind, of, kind of what we've touched on. I mean, we see is like distance, proximity to home. Um, we haven't heard from Chelsea yet. Chelsea, would you like to, to weigh in on this question? Yeah, um, I think it, what I've noticed is just the open openness and willingness between everyone to share these different aspects of their culture that I've really appreciated it, um, since being a student at IAIA. Um, and I've really, like I said, appreciated it and will definitely miss that aspect of learning and growing from my fellow students. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Well, let's talk about your work. Um, I know that a lot of folks, oh, you have something? Well, I wanna talk about Chelsea's work too. I think yeah. should, with the time, you know, I think we should pull up uh, some of Chelsea's work. Sure. I know you've got a couple of pictures ready. Chelsea, um, I was so, and I'm so happy to finally meet you. For those of you watching, I haven't met Fuku or Chelsea in person yet. So this is very exciting for all of us. <laughs> but as, as uh, Hank pulls up Chelsea's work, Chelsea, in your description that you sent over in your portfolio, mm -hmm. I'd love for you to speak more about the your design work and the inspiration. I recall maybe some 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 Catholic background and maybe the stained glass work. Um, and I want to hear more about that because I cannot get over your your paper cutting. It's out of this world. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us about it. Yeah. So going into my senior project, I knew that I wanted to focus on the idea and concept of stained glass. Um, but initially I thought that I was going to be making paintings and I just kind of happened to try first cutting canvas and then canvas is hard to cut. So then I just moved to paper um, and was really inspired by the intricate detail work and patterns found in um, stained glass windows, particularly from the um, Gothic time period of churches. Um, and then I started to look uh, at my own personal cultural history. Um, my mom is white and my dad is Native American. So the project just kind of started to merge both of my cultures together, the Catholic background and then my Native American background. So my designs incorporate things like um, quill work, beading, weaving patterns, uh, eight point stars found in star quilts. And I just combine them into these patterns with the idea, knowing that they will be going onto the color shifting material to create that stained glass effect. Um, and I've really enjoyed making them and getting to tell my own story through these pieces. Definitely. Um, and as thank you, Hank, for pulling those up and sharing with with our panel today. Um, I was so excited. Also, we had had so many talks about do we suspend it from the ceiling? Or, you know, for me, I was like, we need it near the windows because in this gallery, if anyone is, if everyone is able to attend, but if you are not in this gallery, you know, there's a there's a whole hallway of, of windows, which is kind of unusual in a muse, art museum setting sometimes, unless they're treated. And Chelsea's work called for natural light work, right? On top of when there isn't light, we can shine lights through it. So we were able to keep it away from the wall, I don't know, about five inches or so. So you're able to see like the cast and the natural use that you use um, from observing another, another, you know, this is an illustration of your personal identity as well. You know, whether we realize it or not, I mean, you're artists, right? That's what you're all doing. And so I was um, so excited to, you know, learn, you know, what you, how you interpret your work, but also 
display it to the to the best way that it it speaks to its interpretation. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. That's your pieces have such a presence to them, especially when walking into the gallery. They are the kind of the light from them that's caught from, from the natural light the hallway of windows is, is just a warm and very inviting feeling. Um, and it, admittedly, it was one of our like biggest head scratchers on how to, you know, adequately uh, display them so that you know that effect could be uh, appreciated to its fullest. Um, let's see. Definitely, there's little secrets. You want there me to are. ask <laughs> how, how we <laughs> that I spend about two days with your work <laughs> <laughs> in the best way, making my our brains work a little different. So thank you. True. You had to call really in the expert to see it. <laughs> Oh, let's see. And uh, it's hand cut paper are the black linear lines. So that kind of focus and intricacy um, and attention to symmetry, you know, does that, um, I mean, that takes a lot of skill. Does that really kind of show you know, who you are as, as an artist in terms like, and do you have like a, a process or like a specific mode that you go right into that, that you know, has you complete? Cause that piece is probably, you know, three by five feet. The, the large one? Yeah. It's about four by seven, I believe. Four by seven. So yeah. it is yeah. Yeah. massive. Yeah. Um, yeah, just tell us what that, I mean, what happens when you slip? <laughs> <laughs> I don't slip. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is very time consuming. Um, the process of designing and then cutting them out. But I find it very meditative when it comes down to it, because I just uh, once the design is all laid out, I just sit, put on a podcast and just start slowly cutting it all out. Um, but yeah, you know, like you're saying, I've always been um, attracted to symmetry in my work. I just enjoy the look of things being very clean and um, like clean and bold, I would say, is what I like my work to look like, because um, it can sometimes look very simple and you don't really notice, you know, how difficult or time consuming it could be. I get a lot of comments asking if it's, you know, um, laser cut or not, um, but I just think that hand cutting it gives it that extra little element. Totally, your your hand cutting talent. Yeah, it's like your work is so precise that it it would you know people don't think twice when they look at it. Oh, this is gorgeous, right? But this was hand cut. You know, it's so yeah. precise that it seemed like it would have been easy. But when you think about you know how linear it really is, it's like oh my god, that's a big math equation to me. I'm like, <laughs> keep me out of it. Yeah, I yeah. I draw a lot of grids um, and use a lot of rulers to make sure everything is symmetrical. Um, but then when you come down to just cutting it, you know, sometimes hand gets tired and you wave a little, but I like those little imperfections. I think it, it ends up looking really nice. Totally. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and yes, the, the black lines um, are the paper mm -hmm. and the, the transparent parts between those black lines is a kind of a question from from one of our viewers, um, uh, the white areas are not actually a paper or a pigment. It is actually what is behind it. 
the white wall. So you can see entirely through except for the um, paper cut black designs. Um, we have a question for our curator, um, which you know kind of uh, leads me into a question that um, I wanted to ask you as well, Jamie. Um, this is from Maddie. Uh, she says, Jamie, when you have a moment, could you speak a little about your process for curating the exhibition? What's your favorite part? I would also love to hear from the artists about how it feels to graduate and finish their final products, projects during COVID times. Um, along with that question um, is, is the question I was going to ask you, Jamie, like, yeah, what is it like working so closely um, with your classmates? Um, how does it inform your direction as you evolve and grow into a curator role? kind of on the flip side of the artists and um, curator, you know, uh, relationship. Sure. Sure. I think that in curating my peers work, because I know a lot of you and, um, and, and very familiar with your work when I see it at the campus and around town. And um, it's important to me to get to know, get to know the artists. So Thank you, Maddie, for your question. And um, the process for curating the exhibit really does start with what are we curating first? And in this instance, it is my peers' work. And to the best of my ability, this is the show of the, the end of their, their time in their BFA studies, right? So I wanted to interpret their pieces in a way that was very singular to get to know their space. When I have a space of 10 different artists, which is what's happening, I want to ensure that each moment that you stop in front of um, each artist's work um, is, is able to be appreciated in, the, in its moment, right? So then, I don't know, I, I would say my favorite part is getting to know the artists. And I know that that doesn't happen every time I'm lucky, you know, in the cur curatorial career, right? Um, however, also favorite part is probably choosing color. Um, if anyone saw my Balzer curatorial work is bright, rich yellow and red and, you know, this green and this behind you, you can see is like, a, I think it was called a um, garnet something, garnet wine. <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, just I really like the bold and in places that it needs to be And this. Um, this exhibit, you know, was a way for me to to curate my my peers work, as I've said, um, but also see to the exposure of my peers work. Um, and as they as they move into into their career, so the the title and content the title was we went wild and this is us going through you know all of our no matter our hardships or disconnect or or distance in this time, um, these artists were able to come and be at the campus if they lived in town and finally produce while we're still going through the motions of a worldwide. Um, really strange existence. It's different every day, um, as all of us know. So here's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah, thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing with us. Um, yeah, the relationship um, between curator and artist is such a such a, a beautiful dance, honestly. Um, and to be a part of this show as it being, you know, my first uh, kind of hands-on experience since. Um, since I started at Mokna um, has been such an incredible honor because, uh, you know, our II students and artists, you are carrying a legacy. Um, we would not be this museum without you all. Um, for, you know, the greater part of the country and the world would, you know, folks know about the incredible ancestral talent and knowledge that moves through you all. 
Um, Suni, you, this piece behind me is one of yours, Metamorphosis. Um, I have overheard visitors uh, comment on um, assuming that it's a wood carving because of the, its wood base, but it is actually predominantly bronze, correct? Um, do, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you work with your bronze mediums and play with um, how it's perceived in its material? Yes. Um, so first of all, a lot of, most of my work always has to do with um, topics regarding the struggles that our indigenous uh, cultures go through and the, the challenges as new generations and where we're going towards. And I feel like through my art, it is a great way to address these topics. So within my work, I tie in uh, environmental uh, issues, social injustice, and also just shine light on the beauty and importance of indigenous culture and knowledge in these, um, in these moments that we live in all over the world. So in this particular piece, Metamorphosis of Healing, which is a bronze, I, I speak about the process of healing, the process of healing as individuals, but also as uh, communities, as indigenous people that we have been through so much. And it's, it's talking about that trauma. So I speak about this through the imagery of a butterfly breaking out of the, um, the chrysalis. And so that's what the image is visually representing is this, this um, feminine figure breaking out of herself, of this stage of trauma, of oppression, um, of sadness, and breaking out of that as a new birth, as an empowered being. And it's also, um, to me, important because it is acknowledging the power of, of women. And to me, it is important as a male artist, as a man to also be part of this conversation. I feel honored to show this work together with um, pieces like uh, Fuku's art piece. And I feel like it ties in really well. And the reason why I, I choose to address this issue too is because it is important for us as male um, to also question ourselves and awaken our consciousness about all the male supremacy that is passed on to us and break that chain so that we don't keep um, passing that on. So that's what this specific piece speaks about. Um, so yeah, my process, I, I work in different materials back home. I carve a lot of wood, I carve a lot of stone. Here at IAIA, I had an amazing opportunity to learn uh, the whole process of bronze casting all the way from the beginning to the very end of the process. So I've made many bronze sculptures, mostly large scale throughout my time here at IAIA. And that is what I've been focusing mostly on. So the process is from the clay, modeling it, um, building the structures for the clay to be on, then making the molds and making the wax uh, castings and making ceramic shells that will hold the hot metal and then welding all the pieces together. So it's a very, very long and complicated process, especially when you're working on the whole thing by yourself but I, I feel like it was a great challenge and I grew so much as an artist by, with my experience here. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Suni. That was such a great response. Um, and for for those of you unfamiliar with um, bronze, bronze work, I mean, and I finally got to see a pour for the first time. Um, it's no joke. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, a bronze pour is a whole scheduled event. Um, Jasmine Novak also does bronze in the show as well. Um, but the the bronze process is really, really quite uh, quite a quite a experience um, from the beginning of shaping and the wax and every process that you do. And Suni, that piece that's behind Hank. I don't know if we have a photo that we can share. I don't know if we have one saved right now, but um, you'll just have to come and see it and all of you watching, but that one behind you, that bronze, um, and this is another piece, we have the ancestor piece. Um, I'd like to talk about also like the weight of that, here we go, yeah, of that, this, the, the dimensions, how tall it is, it's almost nine feet tall, right? Yeah. Right, and so it took when we were when we were assembling her. I had requested, um, and Suni also actually offered to to be present when we assembled her, and it took three of us, <laughs> and two for the top part. <laughs> so, no joke, no joke. Really, really beautiful. Um, Suni, there was a question, a comment, essentially. Um, Joanne Balzer. It says. Um, you mentioned the indigenous cultures down south in reference to Hispanic and Latino. Um, if you could elaborate a little bit further on where you're from, because okay. I think that that's, you know, you had mentioned that and it's people do reference your part of the globe sometimes as this, you know, very, but please further elaborate on what you meant by that. Yeah, so I am part of the Quechua nation. So the, the Quechua people are one of the largest indigenous groups, spoken language, live culture in the Andes, in the Andean mountains, in Peru, in Bolivia, Ecuador, part of Argentina. So it's, it's very big. And like us, the Quechua people, there are many, many other indigenous nations in South America. Sadly, we are all thrown into this um, one word, which is either Hispanic or Latino, which completely erases our indigenous roots. So that's what I was um, commenting on, that being at IIA gives me the opportunity to also show um, my culture, our live indigenous culture, and reconnect our... Um, our cultures with the indigenous brothers and sisters from the north. You know, we before colonization, we had no borders. We had trading routes throughout the whole continent, and that was interrupted by this painful uh, process of colonization. So, still to this day, there is a lot of ignorance amongst ourselves um, having to do with like our origins and our indigenous heritage. So that's what I what I was talking about. So yeah, I am from Peru. My mom is actually from New Mexico, from Taos, and my dad is from Peru. He is Quechua. I grew up in uh, the sacred valley of the Incas, Cusco, Peru. That is my home. And I came here to New Mexico to study and have this experience as an artist and this cultural experience and interaction as well. Uni, thank you. I'm so sorry that I'm so technology challenged. I have a photo that I'm going to bring up and to have a detailed image of the sculpture you're talking about, the metamorphosis. Um, I had a friend that came through the other day and I was giving them kind of a private behind the scenes and she was just like, 
does he do a lot of work? Because I would love to have something like this in the foyer of my house. Like she was just blown away. And I was like, yeah, actually he's real busy. <laughs> Let's see. I'll just flash up an image. Yeah, these all of these artists that are featured in the show um, also simultaneously were getting ready for an art show at the Balzer Gallery that's on the campus as well. So they were producing um, two times worth than they normally would during their midterms. Um, so every single one of you were so busy and now it's your finals and we're taking <laughs> more of your time, but really, really grateful for it. Yeah, there's SUNY's piece there. Um, but, and we have a few of SUNY's pieces, just like we have a few of everyone's pieces. Um, uh, and uh, SUNY also has these really great masks on a grid of, uh, I think it's 12 by 12, no, 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 three by, there's 12 of them, three by three, uh, three by four, just kidding, three by four. Um, so there's a whole mask part, there's, you know, a bronze ancestor coming out of the ground. Um, and uh, just, I am excited for everyone to come by if they're able. Um, hopefully with the Mokna app, we're able to do a virtual version of that and that will be uploaded soon. Mokna does have an app. So just waiting for that to be accessible for those of you that can't come and visit in person. Speaking of apps and technology, um, as we're kind of wrapping up the last bit of this awesome conversation. Um, Jamie, you uh, um, added an interactive element to the exhibition in the form of a Spotify playlist that artists can um, access, or sorry, visitors can access and you know, kind of dip in on what artists have been listening to um, during their creative processes. And I'm just wondering if anybody would like to, you know, um, talk about why they chose the songs that they chose. Um, if there are any other like uh, creative mediums that like get you in the zone as you're working, um, that kind of get you pumped up, gassed up. Um, and I'd like to kind of learn a little bit about that. It was kind of fun to be able to contribute to such an eclectic uh, playlist. Um, and so I'd like to, to hear about, yeah, what are you guys jamming to? Um, really quickly, I, because there's a great question about plans for after graduation for these seniors. So I'll summarize this really quickly. I had seen a great lecture out of the shed um, uh, from uh, in Brooklyn, which is a contemporary museum there. And they were using a Spotify playlist for a singular, singular artist. And I just thought, man, all of these artists who are producing, I know, and I see it on their social medias. Well, most of you, you know, that you're sharing music while you're while you're producing, while you're existing. So, and artists have great taste in music, right? So I decided I wanted to work with Spotify and create a QR code that people could scan and then take home with them. And I didn't put it in any particular order. I made sure it was kind of out of order. If you want to share what you will listen to, um, Go right ahead. If not, it can be secretive. Um, and then we can talk about your plans for after graduation quickly. <laughs> I don't mean to disappoint Jamie because um, you said artists have must have good taste in music because while I work on my art, I use I always listen to comedy on YouTube. Um, recently, I'm I started to watch Tom Segura. Tom Segura, I can't, I think he's, um, I'm not sure where he's from, but his joke is so inappropriate and I'm not supposed to laugh, but it's just hilarious. And especially I finally started to understand American music, I mean, American jokes and black jokes. So it's even more um, funny and it keeps me going when I'm working on my pieces, so. It could be a suggestion to everyone. It's it's good to listen to a comedy. Well, the rest you all will just have to check out the playlist. Masuni, you wanted to chime in about your choices. 
Um, yeah, so I feel like um, music is definitely one of my fuels when I'm working. I, I feel like I need to, to listen to music and that puts me into this uh, space where I can go for hours and hours nonstop and that's the only way I can get the type of work that I do done is through nonstop long days of work. And without music, I don't think I would be able to do it. If I don't have music with me, I'll, I'll be singing to myself, you know? But I have uh, quite a big uh, variety of music. I, I do listen to a lot of our traditional music, uh, some of our more like contemporary music expressions of different parts of the Andes. I think I chose some um, some songs there that are more like upbeat, um, more contemporary Andean music from Ecuador, and then like a slower, um, more traditional from Peru. But I'll listen to also contemporary modern music from different places in the world. I like exploring a lot. So I'll jump into the internet and just like explore different music from from everywhere in the world, yeah. And then I think the question was, what what's next? Um, so for me, I am definitely going to keep producing my work um, with the materials that are uh, that I have access to at the moment. So I'll probably, when I'm back home, I'll probably carve more wood, work on jewelry. I'm, I'm also really into um, short films, which I've been doing lately. And when I'm here, I will keep producing more of my sculptures and bronze and other materials. So just keep the um, same productive and maybe also getting my master's degree somewhere. All right, Chelsea or Fuku, where do you, what are your plans after graduation with your BFA here in the next week? Um, yeah, my plans after graduation are to rest for a second. <laughs> and then I'm applying to grad schools. I wanna keep exploring um, these, these paper cutouts and design work that I've been making. Um, so just to continue to create and work and share my story and project with as many people as I can. I'm the same way with Chelsea. Uh, I need to rest because I've been going uh, constantly this past four years, uh, even with three months of summer break, I work in Japan. So I would really appreciate if I could go somewhere nice, maybe Hawaii, somewhere like that to just rest. Um, but after that, I would um, continue working on my work. Um, just like Suni and Chelsea said, keep producing, keep staying creative and keep challenging myself through my art practices. So that's my plan after graduation. Amazing. I um, fully endorse and encourage all the rest for, for you all. You deserve it. Um, also, you know, it's just extra important right now. And, you know, Jamie and I were just discuss, discussing just before this, you know, how important it is that you all, you know, have each other to carry along the way um, through your journeys. It's so special, um, you know, take care of each other, take care of yourselves. Um, Jamie, take care of yourself. <laughs> what, what would you like to tell them about the future? Um, I think with this exhibition, um, I was asked a lot over and over by many peers and members of the community um, for if there was going to be an opening. 
um, and unfortunately there was not. Um, so I hope to I, I hope to see too if the world doesn't get too far out, you know, wild, that there is a closing reception. Um, I do believe that you, as artists of IAIA, um, Mokna that IAIA Mokna wouldn't exist without its alumni. And so I want to see too, I had a lot of piqued interest from former alumni and gallery owners on Canyon and museum workers that are ready to meet you. And I can't wait to see to some FaceTime. Um, so I'm grateful that you all are, and all of the other artists, thank the three of you for being here, but the other seven artists that are in the show, thank you for your hard work and working with us and meeting us in the middle when we were curating if, if the community doesn't know, and those of you watching, IAIA's campus is 20 minutes away from downtown Santa Fe, where Mokna is located. So thank you also to the IAIA faculty um, and our great studio art leaders and our museum leaders. Um, and hopefully we have a closing reception. The, the final date is January 30th. So look for that.